Hello, welcome to the lesson revising and inspector calls. As always, you're starting with a retrieval quiz. So if you follow the link in the middle of the screen, if you're doing it on PowerPoint, or copy and paste the uh, link for the retrieval quiz if you're in PDF. And if you're on YouTube watching this, you can of course follow the link that's in the description just below this. Right, quick overview of today's session. We are of course focusing on Act 3 of the inspector calls today, uh, the, you know, the end of the play. Now the challenge for everybody is to explore the characterization and narrative development in Act 3. And hopefully a lot of you will also push to that Aspire outcome, which is to evaluate Priestley's character and narrative construction in Act 3. So hopefully a lot of you are going to aim for that sort of higher level of challenge. Now for today's starter, it's a vocabulary builder task. Now the idea is in the middle of the screen, in that big white box, uh, you've got these key bits of vocabulary, the key words to do with key themes and key, key concepts and ideas from the text. So in the purple, you've got the key idea. We've got here, for example, power to start with. And the black uh, words after that, so authority, control, ability, defense, disadvantage, and so on, are words that link to that particular idea. Now, the idea is what you're going to try and do is link as many of those words as possible to the characters. Burning, as a first example, uh, if we took the word power, He's linked to the idea of power in terms of authority, absolutely he has authority over his workers. He controls their lives to some extent through the money they earn and so on and so forth. So the idea is for each of these characters, uh, Burley, Mrs. Burling, Sheila, Eric, Gerald, Inspector Gould and Eva Smith, you try and run through as many of those words as possible. You can do this as little mind maps if you wish to, you can do them as, as thought showers, you can simply list as a bullet point list, uh, useful vocabulary as well, to those characters from that, from that box, however works for you. Do, I would recommend strongly, Make notes on, a, on some paper, either on the text if you have that in front of you. You can do it on this lesson if you have that as a printout in front of you. Or in your exercise book, your notebook, and that's absolutely fine as well. Five, ten minutes should be plenty of time for that. Right, now for your first main task in today's session, uh, I'd like to try and track the theme of class and wealth. Now the idea is this grid, as you'll have seen before, um, is about trying to record key ideas about that particular theme in the text. And it gives you lots of boxes linked to key aspects of the text relating to that theme. We've got, for example, a key moment, key moment one, with a linked quotation. There's a key moment two at the bottom of the screen as well with a linked quotation. There's a box for relevant characters, a box for images and symbols, a box for links and changes to how that theme comes across, and of course, a big green box for the view given overall. So in summary, across the whole text, What's the theme given? What's the, the impression given of that theme? Now, again, if you have this as a printout, you can, of course, write in the boxes. Uh, if not, you can reconstruct this grid in your exercise book, in your notebook. That's absolutely fine. Or simply do a series of subheadings and make notes below those. All right. Now, this will be a really useful revision task and revision tool for when you come to look at back at the text in terms of exams and that kind of thing. So hopefully that will be useful. Again, about 10 minutes should be ready for this. That should be enough for this. But try and get those key ideas down, this nice, neat summary and that essentially will become uh, an, uh, like an essay plan for you, this core set of keynotes based on that key theme from the text. Right, that brings us to our extract for today's session. Now, it's an important moment, this one. This is very much about, um, about Eric being interviewed by an inspector, as well we hear Eric's account of what happened with Eva Smith, Daisy Renton, you know, or Mrs. Burley, in terms of all names that she uses during the text. As previously, the white box is the actual extract, the yellow box is a series of prompts, things you want to think about in relation to the extract, uh, narrative, character, vocabulary, imagery, linking, context, and themes. All those things are things we always look at with our extracts, when we dissect them for um, you know, essay questions or simply analysing text. Most of them will apply, if not all of them, there may be one or two that are less applicable, um, but that's a judgement call as you go through. I would very strongly recommend that if you have the text in front of you, you write all over it, give yourself loads of notes, um, to try and work through and share your thinking. If you don't have the actual text in front of you, you can simply annotate this extract if you have a printout of the lesson. If you don't have the extract in front of you and the lesson in front of you, you can, of course, simply make notes, uh, just bullet point notes, absolutely fine in your exercise book or your notebook, but do make sure you put a subheading on it or a heading on it so you can really clearly see what this is when you did it, and so on and so forth. Have a work through, and when you've had a chance to do that, press play, and I'll run through a few key ideas uh, that you may want to consider or to have considered. Right, let's start with narrative. Uh, what's happening in the extract? Why is this most significant in the text as a whole? Well, it's Eric's account of what happened with Eva Smith. Now, this follows on from a long line, a whole sequence of every single character 
being interviewed by the inspector in terms of their key actions towards Eva Smith, starting with Burling, then of course uh, with, with Sheila, with Gerald, with Mrs Burling, and then with Eric. So it's that last person in the graphic chain of interviews. Of course, narratively it's important because um, it's this inverted narrative in terms of Mrs Burling and Eric being interviewed. Mrs Burling actually met Eva last out of the family, but she's interviewed before Eric. So we get that sense of dramatic irony building up, and then the emphasis lies on Eric in terms of you know, that final dramatic impact of him being interviewed. It's also significant because um, it shows, again, the treatment of Eva um, by, by Eric. Um, and what it shows is um, this, this string of um, actions towards Eva um, and how those things impact on her as a character and on our understanding of how you know, these, 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 these working class people are exploited, dominated, um, victimised even by the middle class, people such as, of course, the Burlings and the Crofts. Um, in terms of character, then, what impression is given of the character here? How is it given? Does the moment change them? How we view them? Well, of course, what this moment is all about is our impression of, of Eric. Um, now, we already know a lot about Eric in the text. We know that he's got a drinking problem, for example. We know that there's these uh, little slips about, um, you know, his thoughts about women and how he understands women and experiences he's had and so on. But this is the point that really comes into very, very sharp focus. Um, so when Eric says, for example, that he insisted, it seems, he's not very clear about it, we get the sense of Eric not just drinking too much, but drinking so much that he doesn't fully remember the things he did. And that's quite a, a severe, quite a heavy level of, of alcohol um, use. But also the way he behaves towards Eva. Um, she told me she didn't want me to go, to go in, but that, well, I was in this, that's it when a chap easily turns nasty, and I threatened to make a row. So we also learn that Eric... Um, is quite used to going out, or at least has gone out, uh, gotten drunk enough that he becomes assertive, potentially even aggressive. Um, there's this horrific moment where we learn also that Eric says, uh, and that's when it happened, and I didn't even remember, that's the hellish thing, oh my God, how stupid it all is. Now, that's the moment at which we know, of course, that um, Eva Smith didn't want Eric to go into her, her room, her apartment, with her. He insisted, he forced his way in, but in a situation which he couldn't refuse. And that's when it happened. And however he, much he may try and euphemise it with the, um, and it happened, um, he can't disguise the fact that what we assume to have happened is that he raped her. You know, she was not willing, he forced himself upon her, or he's forced the situation, there we go. Um, and he can't even bring himself to say what he did. He has to euphemise it, that's when it happened. I don't even remember. Um, there's also these things about Eric in terms of how serious, how seriously he takes what he did. Um, he can't bring himself to say it, that shows a sense of shame or an acknowledgement of the fact that it's an awful thing. But then there's also this idea, I don't even remember, that's the hellish thing. Well, it's all very well, Eric, complaining about the fact that you don't remember it. I mean, that is, that is awful, of course. Um, but presumably, more awful for the person who endured what you put them through. And then also this idea of um, how stupid it all is. And when we think of, you know, this, how horrific what he's strongly implying he did uh, was, to, to, to describe it as stupid, seems to really downplay the severity of it. Um, there's also, as, as we move through it, the impression of Eric as well. Um, having gone through this experience, and you know, having, and knowingly it seems, having, having raped someone, Eric then goes through it again. Um, he had to see her again in the palace bar, more drinks, yes, though that time wasn't so bad. So this is not someone who learns from their experiences, he does the same thing again and again and again, it seems. You took her home again, yes, and so we talked of it. Um, now, again, they have sex. It says, uh, you made love again, yes. But Eric also is very, very careful to point out that he wasn't in love with her or anything. Um, he almost seems to feel that this is a defence on his part. That because he wasn't in love with her, that makes it somehow more acceptable. But he does also defend himself by saying that I liked her. But I liked her. She was pretty and a good sport. And this idea of, um, you know, a, a good logic for, you know, um, having sex with someone is that she was pretty in a good sport as a defence. And again, this real lack of understanding of the severity, the seriousness of what he's done. So our view of Eric really does change here. We know that he's immature, we know that he drinks too much, and yet also there's a complete mismatch between um, the severity of his actions and the seriousness with which he takes them. A uh, real, real mismatch there. Right, vocabulary-wise, um, which words help us to infer, which choices can we do as significant? Well, there's a load of ones here that are quite relevant. Um, this idea of, um, you know, that's when it happened. It is important, the fact that he euphemises uh, what he did. The hellish thing, uh, God in terms of, you know, hellish and God. 
um, this, uh, this mild blasphemy that he's using. Stupid is a very odd word choice as well. How stupid it all is, rather than how awful, how hideous his actions were. But then also when we move down, things like, for example, um, uh, a good sport. Sport is an interesting word. Because sport suggests that it was fun. It was just a bit of fun. It was playful. It's not serious. Um, and it suggests a degree of mutual involvement, which doesn't match this kind of exploitative tone of the relationship between them. Um, you know, Eva Smith is someone who's been exploited by every member of the Burning family in some way, shape or form. And Eric, in some ways, is, is the worst of them. Um, you know, Burning takes away her job, Burning takes away, you know, um, her ability to fend for herself, but she finds another job. She takes away her ability to be a worker. Uh, Gerald takes away her ability to fend for herself, her independence. Mrs. Burling takes away her, her right to sympathy. But Eric takes away her right to her, to her own body, her right to say no. And there's nobody else in the play, Reen, that does that. She is still, to some extent, in control of her, you know, access to her own body, to herself. And yet Eric takes that away. Um, and sport just completely downplays that. Um, in terms of imagery, then, any kind of metaphors or similes, not massively, no. Um, you know, into, beyond kind of the, the vocabulary and some of these things. We could view alcohol as a motif in the text, uh, the idea of that corruptive influence of the older generation, like Mr. Burning, um, going through it, but also alcohol being a symbol of, um, you know, wider corruption in society, a lack of morality, um, that kind of thing. Uh, in terms of linking, how's the section of the earlier points in the text? Well, there were those hints in Act 1 when they talk about women, uh, when they talk about clothing, for example, and Burning has those views about clothing being a symbol of a woman's self-respect, etc., etc., etc. And then Eric says, yes, I remember, and then stops himself. And that's a key moment there as well. Um, Eric's alcoholism as well, he's drinking at the start of the play. Now, this does perhaps cast a slightly different light on his drinking problem. Uh, we know he's got an alcohol problem you know, when he meets Eva Smith and when he does what he does. And at the same time, when we also learn about the fact that he, uh, he knows you know, that um, you know, Eva was, was pregnant, he knows that you know, he offered to marry her, it seems and yet was turned down flat, was, you know, had access to her cut off. And possibly it colours the idea that, um, in terms of his behaviour, that he was drinking to forget. He's drinking as a release on some level. It, it's possible. So it does also link to that as well. It links back to Gerald, in terms of these dual relationships. Gerald, um, in some ways, you know, it, it is an equally exploitative relationship, although with Gerald it's an emotional exploitation, as well as a physical one as well, as that sense of dependency. With Eric and uh, with Eva, later on in the relationship, there's a degree of choice. And more a sense of a natural relationship, in some ways, than there was with Gerald. So it links to that as well. And of course, it links very, very closely back to Mrs. Burling and her refusal to help Eva Smith. Context. How does the extract link back to the time when the text was written, and does our current context influence how we read it? Well, the context at the time, yes, obviously. We have this, this trend of middle class people exploiting the working class on every single level, uh, through their physical labour, um, through their moral character in some ways, and physically through their own bodies in terms of prostitution, which is what we see here, um, simply being viewed as um, you know, someone to be exploited and taken advantage of. Um, there's also, in terms of the extract, um, this double standard between the, the genders, that men are viewed as, um, you know, having every right to exploit women, and women are not given the same sort of um, leniency in terms of their sexual behaviour and so on. And from a modern point of view, um, this idea of this post-Me Too movement kind of idea, that we're much more aware, much more conscious of those double standards, um, and people's right to you know, define the hats of their own bodies and their right to choose. So actually, from a modern perspective, Eric's actions are even more severe in some ways um, than they would have been seen as at the time. Themes, um, you'll be looking at ideas about gender, for example, social class, um, morality is a key one, action and consequence, for example, responsibility and accepting of responsibility, generational differences, all those sorts of things. Um, and in terms of that generational thing, you can also look at, for example, um, the shock that Mrs. Burling and Burling have. But it's more about it being Eric rather than about what happened to the girl. Um, that's kind of where their key focus is. Right, and that brings us to, quite obviously, a character profile based on Eric. Now, for this, it's the same boxes as you have had for previous characters that we've looked at. So there's a box for key relationships, a box for key actions, including the acts in which those actions you know, occur. Uh, changes during the text. We've got four quotation boxes, and the good idea is to spread them across the, uh, across the text, some from early, some from later on, that kind of thing. There's a box there for ambitions, concerns, and motivations. A box for positive qualities, because even Eric does have some positive qualities. 
and negative qualities, obviously, which is quite an easy box to fill in in, in many ways. And of course, a box for linked images, symbols, and themes as well. Again, this should take sort of five to ten minutes, really, uh, at most. Um, again, as previously, if you have it as a printer, you can write all over the boxes. If you don't, you can simply make notes in your Excel book, and that's absolutely fine as well. But do make sure you put subheadings on to keep it absolutely clear. All right, five to ten minutes, and go. Right, and let's draw it together another way as well. We've had a look at a character, and this is a chance to draw together the narrative. Now, of course, we've seen this before as well. This is a chance to summarise the events from uh, Act 3 of the text. As previously, we've got boxes for the opening, how does it start, the closing, how does it finish, uh, key events that happen in the act, quotations that link to those key events, a box for characters and relevance, obviously Eric, sort of important in that one, images, symbols and themes, settings and significance, and links across the text as well. Now, this should be the same format you've used for your Act 1 and Act 2 summaries. And as previously, of course, you can write all over this if you have that in front of you. If not, then simply make notes and settings absolutely fine as well. I apologise for that sound from my computer that popped up as I said that. So, have a go at summarising um, Act 3. This should take about five minutes, really. It should be nice and quick, but a useful summary in terms of tracking what happens in the text as, and, and, and when, and why it's important, that kind of idea. Right, that brings us to our plenary. Just a sort of 10 minute task here. So we've got these four statements, which are all perspectives, uh, essentially on the text and what happens in the text and, and characters. Now, as previously, the idea is that these statements are more or less valid or debatable. Um, the problem is none of them are as simple as a yes or no response. So the idea is you work through each one, you decide what you think, and try and decide why you think that, what are the influences on your, your perspective. Um, and if you can, link to particular moments in the play, characters, you know, ideas, themes, even quotations, so much the better. So have a read through, try to give yourself some brief responses. You can uh, simply do this in your head, if that's useful, or you can write them out as paragraph responses as well, or in sentences as bullet points, however works for you. Mind maps even, great, go for it. Have a quick think, make your notes if applicable, then press play again on the audio, and I'll run through a few ideas you might want to consider. Right, let's start with that first one. All members of the family are equally responsible and need to equally accept their responsibility. Well, the idea of it being a chain of events is this idea of uh, every single part, person playing their part within this wider structure. Um, are they equally responsible? Well, the thing is, we do evaluate some of them differently. You know, Burnley, of course, we blame a lot because he started the whole thing and yet can partially defend his actions. Sheila's actions, are, of course, are less defensible, and yet at the same time, she feels bad about what she did, and her moral soundness throughout the play, is, for most of it certainly, um, does help us to forgive her slightly more. When we look at someone like Gerald, for example, although actually, in some ways, he treated Eva relatively well um, and allowed her to choose, his lack of acceptance that what he did was wrong, his lack of learning from the experience, and also the dramatic extent to which he influenced her life in terms of taking away um, her emotional independence and so on, um, does lead us to blame Gerald slightly more. Um, Eric, for example, although what he did was horrific, actually the fact he learns from the experience, the fact he tried to make up for it afterwards, and remember that makes him more or less unique among the Burnings, does actually help us to, uh, if not forgive him, but at least to judge him less harshly in some ways. So actually, it all sort of balances out to the point where all of them are responsible. And all of them need to accept the responsibility. And it's because they don't accept the responsibility that the whole thing starts again at the end. Bottom left, the inspector seems to blame Gerald less than the Burnings, despite his failure to fully acknowledge his guilt. Well, the inspector does mention um, in his closing remarks before he departs that, um, that young man Croft, he, that Gerald at least made her happy for a while. And there is some truth in that. Um, Gerald is sort of the only person out of the entire group of them who did give her some sort of happiness. And yet at the same time, giving her a bit of happiness and then taking away all those things that he, he, he had given her, in some ways is a more dramatic fall than any of the others had been. So the inspector does seem to blame Gerald less, but that doesn't mean actually that we forgive him more. Um, that is quite open to discussion and debate. There's a flaw in that. Right, top right. As an audience, we forgive Sheila and Eric more than their parents because they accept blame and feel guilty, even though their actions are least defensible. There is some truth in that, absolutely. Sheila and Eric become figures of, uh, if not moral authority, but at least moral um, understanding by the end of the text. They accept that what they did was wrong, they accept some sort of blame for that. At the same time, 
The parents don't, and therefore we blame them more. Even though Berlin can defend himself, he fired someone who went on strike. There's a logic to that, um, even if it's not something we feel you know, in, in favour of. Mrs. Burling refused to give charitable money to someone who lied to her about her situation. And at that point, again, it is defensible as an action. So, yes, we do sort of accept um, Sheila and Eric more at the end than their parents. Um, and, of course, it's possible to blame the parents as well for Sheila and Eric's actions. After all, they've gained their attitudes, they've gained their, um, their behaviour towards people in the working class. Partially uh, influenced, of course, you know, they've gained them from their parents on some level. So, yes, to a large extent, we can probably agree with that one. And bottom right, Pretty doesn't intend the audience to know whether Eva Smith was one person or many different people, and it isn't relevant anyway. Is again, a valid interpretation of the play in many ways. We end the play uncertain whether Eva Smith was one person or many. That's absolutely true. And yet at every single moment in the play, in each interview, in each encounter, in each um, account, we sort of have to believe at that point that Eva Smith was that person at that point. And the cumulative impact of that on Eva Smith um, does partially depend on this being a single character. Uh, again, at the same time, that open question is key in the play to making the audience question um, our own behaviour and reflect on our own responsibility as an audience. And it isn't relevant anyway. Yeah, to assume that Eva Smith was a single person or to obsess over that is to miss the point that she symbolises the entire working class, all women, and all these victimised uh, people in society. And that ambiguity is central, really, to the, the point of view that Priestley wants us to have as we leave the theatre after watching the play. Uncertain, still in a state of flux, and reflecting on our own actions you know, and our own accountability. Right, and that leads us to our final overview. So hopefully all of you will feel that you've managed to explore some points about narrative and characterization in Act 3. Um, I think if you've gone through those tasks today, that's, you, you can't really avoid having done that. Um, but hopefully a lot of you will also feel you've managed to achieve that aspire outcome, where we're evaluating Priestley's character and narrative construction in Act 3. And certainly all that work on Eric and that drawing together of those ideas do facilitate that. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, and I'll see you in our next session, uh, which is going to be, I believe, on poetry in actual fact. So hopefully that's been useful. Take care.